Good morning, everyone. Before we get into our service, I just want to share a couple of announcements with you. The first one I want to highlight is um, the bowling night that will be sponsored by Women's Ministries. Want to let you know that that will be happening on February 7th. That's a Saturday evening, next week actually, at 6.30 at Rossmuir Lanes. There is a sign-up sheet for that, and it will be out in the uh, foyer at the back as you leave. So please be sure to sign up for that. Two hours of family fun and bowling. Please be sure to sign up for that. Also, the ABC February food sale brochures are also going to be on the table in the foyer. And uh, the deadline for those orders is Monday, February 9th. So please be sure to get your order in by Monday, February 9th. So you have one more week to uh, get your orders together. Today, uh, the German-Russian service will be taking place uh, in the Centennial Hall after our service today. So I'm going to ask if you, you, unless you're a part of that program, please avoid going into the Centennial Hall so that we can be respectful of their time as they worship uh, at that time. So please note the German-Russian group will be worshiping in the Centennial Hall downstairs after our service today. Leaders, please be aware that your annual business reports are due on February 5th. That's this Thursday. Please have your reports completed and into Agnes by that time. And our, my final announcement this morning, I just want you as a church to be aware that there will be an annual church business meeting that for our members only on February 28th at 6 p.m. So all members, please clear your calendars for the annual business meeting that will be at 6 p.m. in the Centennial Hall downstairs. Welcome to church. Welcome to the undying body of the ever-living Son, where God's promises and God's people are radically made one. Welcome to the romance of the world, the marriage ceremony of Christ, where God is betrothed to man by proposing with his life. Welcome to the only place where the unholy can meet unholiness and yet holy still survives. Welcome to the only place that you can come in dead and yet come out alive. Welcome to this place, this place whether on pews or chairs, in walls or air, under steeples or stairs, by thousands or in pairs, this place, <laughs> this place is legendary, holy, ancient, modern, famous, hated, living, vibrant, ageless, not because of a location, not because there are cars parked on the pavement, not because we made a sign and named it, this place it's it welcome to the place where individuals are shaped into a larger whole where bread and wine feed our hearts and intoxicate our souls where race money and power no longer have a role where the outcast impoverished and broken come to be consoled welcome to our home the bride of Christ on a reckless search. Welcome to life. Welcome, welcome to church. I'm gonna ask you to stand as we ask the Lord's presence in my
every Saturday you come here to meet us, to love us, and to bless us. And I pray that you may do that again, this worship service. Use each one of us as your tools to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us as we sing our opening hymns, number 10, on the screen, Come Christians Join to Sing. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this awesome privilege of being here to worship you this morning. Thank you for setting aside this time each week where we can just have our, a date with you, where we can just spend time getting to know you more, catching up, and just uh, spending time to the, together, quality time together. And Lord, we just pray that you will forgive us of all our sins. Please remove from us everything that is unlike you. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be the people that you want us to be, Lord. I pray a special blessing upon Pastor Peter today. I pray that you will speak through him. May the words that he speaks come from you. And I pray that we as a congregation, that we will be ready to hear your word. Help us to be open to what you have to say to us. And I pray that you will give us the courage to follow through on what you ask us to do. As we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth today, Lord, we pray that your name will be glorified, magnified, blessed. And we pray a special blessing on those who could not be here today. Please comfort them as only you can and help them to know that you are with them and that they are not alone. Please, we just want to give this service over to you now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Today, our offering will be for the NAD evangelism. Many evangelistic projects and meetings take place throughout the North American division. And during the last several years, we have focused on some of the major cities in the territories of our division. Because of the generous offerings given by our members, the division has been able to support many of these city projects. We have a worldwide mission that includes the millions living in the large metropolitan areas. Jesus, in Matthew 23, verse 37, and Luke 13, 34, tells us how much he cared for people in Jerusalem. So he cared about those living in the cities, and he cares for people living in our cities today, too. Today, let us worship by returning a faithful tithe as the Lord impresses us and as we give to this offering of the North American evangelism. God will bless us, and he will also bless those who hear the message of Jesus Christ. Will the ushers please stand? Lord, as we return to you some of what you've given to us, we pray that you will pour out that blessing that you promise us for being faithful to you. And for those of us, Lord, who cannot give, we pray a special blessing on them. Help them to know that you love and care for them just the same. Please may the offerings collected be used as they are intended to be used. In Jesus' name, amen. Usually we have, at the beginning of the year, after nominating committee has finished the job, which is usually in September, uh, ordination for the newly elected officers. Most of them are already ordained, but there are some of them who were not. So I would invite the elder and the deacons or deacon, uh, deacons who were not ordained to please come up front here, and I would invite other elders to join me so we can lay our hands on them and pray and Pastor Joseph too, so that God will bless them in their ministry uh, as they are starting. So those of you who are deacons who are not ordained and uh, elder, could you please come uh, up here? And the rest of you elders who are ordained, could you join me so we can lay our hands on them and pray?
Our Heavenly Father, we come before you to present you our brothers and sisters who are willing to serve and to add value to our church members and people in our community. And I pray that you may bless Barrett, that you may bless Jenny, but that you may also bless Cormac as they are serving in this church, that you may give them the Holy Spirit so they can do that with a rejoiced heart to make the difference in our church, in our services, so that people can be blessed and find you as their Savior and Lord. Please be with them as they are ministering in the next few years of their lives and help them to remember that we are servants and that Christianity is all about serving one another and adding value to each other. Thank you, Father, for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, you just witnessed a very special moment. It's very uh, awe-inspiring to actually uh, be ordained like that. And it's a heavy responsibility. And um, I just, I'm so happy for those who have been ordained today. Because it's, it's moving. You're called to work for God. And it's not always easy. And so I want to encourage you, uh, please, don't feel like you need to be perfect. You don't need to be perfect to work for God. You need to be trying. You know, we're, our trying is righteousness to God. And I, I just want to encourage us as a church to just keep trying. That's what counts. That's why some of the people in the hall <laughs> of faith are in there. They tried. That's all they did. So I just want to encourage you with that today. Uh, th right now, the children are going to have a story given to them by David Dealman. Pastor's son is crying. I guess I'm scary. <laughs> Good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? Does anybody remember what the pastor was preaching about last week? Anyone? What was it about? How to help other people? Okay. A little bit more specific. Does anybody remember? How about you? Okay, no, that wasn't it. Does anybody remember? It was about, remember he had a picture of a soldier there? A Roman soldier? What was that Roman soldier wearing? What was he wearing? The armor of God. Do you guys remember that? He was talking about the armor of God and there was all different types of armor that the soldiers were wearing. Was that the week before? Oh, I'm sorry. This week he's preaching about the armor of God. He told me to make sure I link that together there because my story doesn't work very good. All right, but how do we put on the armor of God? Does anybody know? How do you get to be friends with Jesus? How do you get to be friends with each other? How do you get to be friends? By loving, right? And you spend time together, right? And so we can spend time with God by reading the Bible and praying. 
Well, I want to tell you, uh, read you a few verses in the Bible that I enjoy. One of them is from Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. It says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. See, God says he's going to take care of us. And another verse in uh, Proverbs 3, this is my daughter's favorite verse, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Submit to him and he will make your paths straight. See, God says trust him and he'll take care of you. And it doesn't matter. Sometimes, do you ever notice that sometimes bad things happen to good people? Do you notice, have you ever noticed that? Well, there's a verse for that too. There's another verse in Romans 8, verse 28, and he says, and it says here, and we know that all things God in in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So God can take any situation and make it work for something good. So do we have to be afraid? Do you know why soldiers wear armor? To protect them. It makes them safe. And it protects them so that they can go into battle and they can be strong and they can feel safe. Well, you know, does anybody remember the last story I told a long time ago, what it was about? What was it about? Oh, that was two stories ago when I burned down my grandpa's barn. (laughs) That's a long time ago. Before that, remember I told you about the story about flying in the airplane? Well, there's been a few times when I was flying in that big airplane where we had some bad things happen. You know, I was hit by lightning twice. One time I could feel the electricity in my feet. And another time the guys in the back of the airplane said, wow, what was that? We just saw a ball of fire go through the airplane. But it happened very fast and it was over. And we were like, okay, we're okay. But sometimes when things happen slowly, We start worrying. And I don't want you guys to worry because these verses tell us that God's going to take care of us. And the story I have for you today is a story I told maybe eight or ten years ago, so some people may know it, but I'm pretty sure most of you haven't heard it, so I'm going to repeat it anyways. But I was in that same Hercules airplane, and we were loaded. We had lots of cargo in the back, and the airplane was heavy. And we were flying from Europe back to Canada, across the Atlantic Ocean. And we had done this a bunch of times. It was no big deal. We're flying along. Everything's good. And then as we went along, we went into the clouds. But we fly in the clouds all the time. That's no big deal. And as we're flying along, all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're getting ice on the airplane. But that's no big deal. The airplane is made to take care of ice. So the aircraft commander turned to the engineer and said, Let's turn on all the anti-icing equipment. So he starts flicking switches and turning everything on, and he goes, oh, boss, we got a problem. The right wing won't de-ice. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal because all the rest of the airplane is de-icing, so we should be okay, right? But you know what? No, you don't think so? Well, you would be right because it's not okay. Oh! Sign him up. Mom and Dad, sign him up. He's already got Aerodynamics 101 down. (laughs) That's right. If the ice builds up on one wing and nothing on the other wing, then the airplane is not going to be able to stay level. And then we'll tumble out of the sky, and that's really bad. So he said, okay, that means we can't de-ice the wing. So he turned off the de-icing on the left wing. And now we're watching because we're a little concerned. How long is this ice going to last? Normally, it's not a big deal because it only lasts for a few minutes, and then you're out. But it kept going and going, and the ice kept building and building. And when the ice goes on the airplane, the airplane gets heavier and heavier. And finally, we are watching the speed on the airplane, and the speed is telling us how fast we're going, and the speed is going slower and slower and slower. And if we get too slow, the airplane stops flying and it falls out of the sky. So we could not stay at the altitude that we were supposed to be at, so we started descending towards the ocean. All right, so now 
the, the aircraft commander told me, because I was the first officer, he said, okay, get on the radio and tell air traffic control that we are unable to maintain altitude and we're in descent because we have to maintain our altitude when we fly. And so I went on the radio and I tried the HF radio and nobody answered. So then I tried the VHF radio to talk to the jets that are flying really high because we were only at 18,000 feet, which sounds like a lot, but in airplanes, that's not very high. The other guys were up at 30 or 40,000 feet. So we were trying to talk to them to see if they could pass a message for us, but we couldn't get any of them either. So then we even tried using the military radio to see if maybe another military airplane was out there and talking to them on the UHF radio, and that didn't work either. Do you know what the problem was? Well, no, it wasn't a problem with the internet. <laughs> we, did not we did not have internet. I don't even know if internet was around that, that time, maybe. But the re antennas were covered in ice, and so we couldn't send our signal. So now we didn't know what to do because the procedures said all kinds of things we're supposed to do for in that situation, but we decided since we were so low, we were going to just stay on our track because we didn't think anybody would be below us because nobody flies that low over the ocean except for us. So we kept going and the airplane kept going down and down and down. And finally we got to the point where we're like, we may have to divert and go somewhere else and so we said the closest place we can go to is the tip of Greenland. So for you guys, you guys might not know where Greenland is. You know where it is? Yeah, well, we right at the bottom tip. We said if uh, in five minutes, if we're not out of this ice, we have to go there because in World War II, there was an airstrip that they used there to take airplanes over to Europe, and we can crash there. And at least we wouldn't be in the ocean because in the ocean, our survival rate was about... Well, less than a minute. We could live in the ocean for less than a minute because the water's so cold. So we had the plan all planned out. And as we're going along, the time's getting closer and closer and closer. And then, poof, we're out of the clouds. It's blue sky. It was like a wall of cloud. The cloud just ended. And we had lost about five or 6,000 feet in our descent as we were going down. And... As the sun came out, all of a sudden the sun was shining on the airplane. It started warming up that ice, and it just started peeling off the airplane, and it came off in big sheets of ice. And it sounded like paper ripping when you just take the paper and you go, Whoosh! that's how it sounded coming off the airplane. Do you think that we were worried during that time? Yeah, we were worried. But do we have to be worried in situations like that? No, because if we have Jesus in our hearts and we put on and we spend time with him and we have all his promises in our heart, then we know he's going to take care of us. And that's what I want you guys to remember, that sometimes bad things happen and they've happened really quick and they're over. Sometimes they happen slow and it takes some time and we start to worry and we start to doubt God. And when we have those times when things are going slow and problems are lasting and lasting remember to trust God because he's he loves you and he's going to take care of you all right okay you can go back to your seats now As I, was, as I was doing my devotion, I came across this quote that I want to share with you. The soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above. And as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly hosts. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth God. Let us with reverent joy, come before our Creator with thanksgiving and the voice of melody. That was encouraging to me. I hope you want to ascend nearer to God with your praise this morning, and that's what we want to do. So let's sing together. 
got it all covered here. All right, let's see.
All right, our final song this morning will be Blessed Be the Lord God Almighty. He deserves that. church family. Today our scripture will be taken from Ephesians 6, chapter 13 to 14. That's Ephesians 6, 13 to 14. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Therefore, put the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplates of righteousness in place. May our Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Morning, church.
keeper of my soul on rough course faring help and safeguard my means this night keeper of my soul I am tired afraid and stumbling shield my soul from the snare of sin I want to welcome you all this morning. Uh, those of you who came home to visit your parents, good to have you here. I want to also welcome those who are online with us, and we know that there is a good number of you there, and we are looking forward to seeing you here in person so we can get to know you. Uh, as you know, we uh, started our series on the armor of God, and the first topic of the first piece of the armor of God was the what? Nope. The belt. The belt of what? The belt of truth. And as we studied that subject, uh, we learned that it's very important to know the truth because devil has a lot of lies and half-truths that he uses to deceive people. And once you know the truth, then half-truth or lie will not affect you. And also, we also learned that it's important not just to know the truth, but to practice the truth. So that's what it means to put on the belt of truth. Today, we are moving on to the next piece of equipment in the armor of God. And it is the breast of righteousness. Well, when we talk about the breast of righteousness, I have the good news and the bad news for you. And let me first share with you the bad news. And it's really, really bad. And in book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 10 and 23, this is what it says. There is none righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh-oh. In Isaiah, the Old Testament scripture, 64, verse 6, it says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Wow. 
How can we as a Christians, as a humans, engage in our daily spiritual battle if our righteousness is like a filthy rag? You see, without the breastplate of righteousness, we will suffer certain defeat. And the problem is, we cannot make ourselves righteous. He who is trying to become holy by his own works in keeping the law is attempting impossibility. No way, Jose, that you can do that. All that we can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. And without the breast of righteousness, we are doomed. We are like Joshua, the high priest who represented the Israel, God's people. In the book of Zechariah, book of Zechariah, chapter 3, he says, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and was standing before the angel. He represents you and me today. And we stand before God and before devil, clothed in filthy rags. Our righteousness is filthy. We do not have it. And that's a serious problem. Don't you think so? But let me share with you good news. As we continue to read Zechariah chapter 3, it says, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. And I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head. And they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. You see, the gospel in the New Testament tells us how God has removed our iniquity from us. And how he had made us righteous. How God, through Jesus, provided for us the breastplate of righteousness. And I want to share with you several Bible texts that talk about this. First one is in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in our filthy rags. Not clean and squeaky clean. But in our filthy rags, he died for us. The next one is 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away your sins. And in him, there is no sin. Do you have sins in your life? I have a good news for you. Jesus came to take away your sins and my sins, my filthy righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be seen for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. 
And the last one is in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 17 and 19. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, which meaning Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam's, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. What a good news. And I like the way the spiritual writer, Ellen G. White, summarized this gospel truth that we just read from the Bible. Listen to two paragraphs. First one is found in the book Desire of Ages. Awesome book, and I would encourage you to read that book. He changed my life and brought me back closer to Jesus and encouraged me to read the Bible every day in my life. So, Ellen G. White, in her book Desire of Ages on page 25, she says, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which we, he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. Isn't this beautiful? Listen to another paragraph, but this one is from the book Steps to Christ. Awesome book, awesome book. Strongly recommend. Translated in many languages. Page 63, Steps to Christ. We have no righteousness of our own with which, which, uh, uh, with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived a sinless life life he died for us and now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness if you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior then sinful as your life may have been for his sake you are accounted righteous Christ's character stands in place of your character as you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. I don't think there is a better news for someone whose righteousness is like filthy rags than hearing these words. Don't you think so? At least for me, it gives me hope. It gives me hope and it inspires me. And that's why this morning, please give your life, give yourself to Jesus and accept him as your personal savior if you have not done so. Because this is the only way how you can be accounted righteous. Only his perfect life accredited to your account can provide for you the breastplate of righteousness and save you. Only his perfect righteousness. His perfect life that he lived for 33 and a half years if you accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord and follow him will be accredited to your account. And God will look at you as though you had never sinned and treat you that way. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In Romans chapter 3, verse 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from, from the deeds of the law. Faith 
in these Bible passages means faith in Jesus as the promised Lamb of God. Faith in Christ's righteousness as ours. Trust in His merits as all sufficient for us with God. You see, Christ's merits, His merits, do not complement our own merits, but are our only merits before God. This is called justification by faith in biblical terminology. Or, in other words, it's called imputed righteousness of Christ. Imputed righteousness of Christ. And you see, this is the root and cause of our justification with God. But there is also the fruit or result of our justification with God. And that is called sanctification or imparted righteousness. Okay? So, imputed righteousness or justification by faith is the root or cause for our salvation. But there is also, as a result of that, as a fruit of that, sanctification. Or, in other words, it's called imparted righteousness of Christ. You see, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, God justifies us and declares us righteous. Someone says, those who God justifies, them he also, what? Sanctifies. Those who God justifies, them he also sanctifies. And more than taking our sins and giving us his righteousness, Christ wants to transform and change us. And in Steps to Christ, another interesting paragraph on page 63. He says, more than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. And you are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to Him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Then, with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same works, works of righteousness or obedience. So we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast, we have no ground for self-exaltation. Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and in the wrought by the His Spirit working in and through us. In other words, our only hope is in Christ's righteousness, twofold Christ's righteousness, imputed one and imparted one. That's our only hope that we have. The righteousness of Christ is a transforming power. It is the principle of life that transforms the character and controls our conduct. You are not the same once you are justified. Once you experience the grace of God, you cannot stay the same. In, gospel, in, in 1 John chapter 2, Verse 29, it says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right is born of him. Once you are justified by faith, once you accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, once you allow him to come into your heart, he then transforms you. He, you become born again and you start living the right way and doing the right things as the result of that. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right 
is righteous, just as he is righteous. You know, some Christians don't see this second aspect of Christ's righteousness that I'm talking here right now, sanctification or imparted righteousness. They stay to the first one only, imputed righteousness and justification by faith. But once God comes into your life, he changes you and he transforms you. You are not the same anymore. You are becoming more like him. In righteousness that, that we have at that time is not the one that keeps the letter of the law, but keeps the spirit of the law too, which is important as much as the letter of the law. And what happens once we are justified is described in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Imparted, rapture, imparted righteousness of Christ is described in those two Bible verses. Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Sanctification. Imparted righteousness. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. God saves you, but he also transforms you and changes you and enables you by the power of the Holy Spirit so now you can follow his decrees. Now that you can do what is right. Because without him we can't do even that. Ellen G. White in Steps to Christ on page 61 says, Instead of releasing men from obedience, it is faith, and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to render obedience. For salvation is the free we do not earn salvation by our obedience. For salvation is the free gift of God to be received by faith. But obedience is the fruit of faith. You see, our obedience now, doing what is right, our transformed and changed character, imparted righteousness of Christ, in other words, are the fruit or fruits of the justification are the results of our justification. The root and cause of our justification with God is not our obedience, but Christ's obedience. We should not confuse the fruits with the root. Someone said, very interestingly, we must be saved in order to be good. We must be saved in order to be good. Remember the experience that Israel had in Egypt with God. He first saved his people out of the bondage of Egypt. And then he gave them the commandments at Mount Sinai. So salvation comes before obedience. Salvation is something that inspires you, empowers you, energizes you. Producing new desire to do what's right and continue that relationship with God. And out love and thankfulness for the salvation that God has provided for you. Now you are doing what's right. Not in order to be saved, but because you are already saved. Does it make sense? It's a result of our salvation. It's not the cause of our salvation. Another saying says, we are not saved by faith and works, but by faith that works. Have you ever thought about that? We are not saved by faith and works. You know, there is a, a great debate among some Christians. Are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Or are we saved by faith and works? Neither of them. We are not saved by works. Because then Christ died in, in vain. If we can save ourselves by keeping the commandments, by doing what's right, then Christ died in vain. He died in vain. We are also not saved only by faith, 
itself because the Bible tells us that even devil believes. But we are not saved by faith and works, but by faith that works. Our faith is the cause for our salvation, but our faith has results in works. We are saved by faith that works. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, he says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, Jesus did not come to save people in their sins, but from their sins. Christ came to save you and me from the control of sin over our daily actions. And I like the commentary of Dr. George Knight on Abundance Bible Amplifier on the book of Matthew on page 45. This is what he's saying. Jesus came to enable us to conquer sin in our lives. That takes place at three levels. First, through his sinless life and his death on the cross, he saves his people from the penalty of sin. Second, Jesus saves his people from the power of sin over their lives. And third, Jesus will eventually save his people from the presence of sin when he returns in the clouds of heaven to give them their eternal rewards. This is the story of the Bible. This is the Bible in summary. The plan of salvation. So, graphically, presenting you this. We have salvation. And there are three, three phases of salvation. Three parts of salvation. Salvation, Jesus saved us 2,000 years ago on Calvary Cross from the penalty of sin, which is what? Eternal death. Now, Jesus is saving you from the power of sin in your life. And ultimately, when he comes again the second time, he will save you from the presence of sin around you. And that's why salvation is made up of three parts. Of justification, which is saving you from the penalty of sin. Of sanctification, which is saving you from the power of sin. Or glorification, which is saving you from the presence of sin. You see, justification is telling us what Jesus has done for us. Sanctification is telling us what Jesus is doing in us as we are having a relationship with him on a daily basis. And glorification is telling us what will Jesus ultimately do when he comes again for the second time. What is he going to do with us? So that's why we have salvation, imputed righteousness, imparted righteousness, and then imparted immortality. Then imparted immortality. Dr. Hans Larondel, in his book, Christ Our, uh, Christ Our Salvation, on page 54, says, Christ's redemptive work restores the original purpose of God's creation of man. The Redeemer delivered us from the defilement of guilt by his precious blood, which is imputed righteousness or justification. And from the enslavement to sin power by the Holy Spirit, this is sanctification or imparted righteousness. Both Christ's righteousness imputed to us and his righteousness wrought in us or imparted to us by his Spirit are made possible by faith alone. Thus, both aspects of Christ's righteousness must always stand together. They always stand together. Both aspects of Christ's righteousness, imputed and imparted. Justification and sanctification always go together. And they are our breastplates of righteousness. So in our daily lives, when we are facing challenges, when we are facing temptations, when we are involved in our spiritual battle with the devil, if you do not put these breasts 
of righteousness. This twofold righteousness of Christ, imputed and imparted, you have no chance against the devil. No chance. And that's why God is urging you and me, please, please, it's here for you. It's a gift. This Christ's righteousness imputed and imparted, it's a gift that is accepted by faith. And as you accept his death instead of yours and his righteousness instead of yours, and as you are having a relationship with him, he will write his laws on your heart and you will be obedient. You will do what is right, but not in order to be saved, but because you are already saved in Jesus Christ. Your sanctification, your sanctified life, your Christ-like character will be a result of your salvation, not the cause of your salvation. And both of them are the work of God. And my prayer is that God will bless each one of you, that every day when you wake up, that beside the belt of truth, you put on yourself the breastplate of righteousness of Jesus Christ because that's your only hope to survive the spiritual battle with the enemy. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the for providing us with the, your armor to protect us from our spiritual enemy. And I pray, Father, that each one of us will accept that gift of the truth and put around our waist 
but also that we may accept the breastplate of Christ's righteousness, imputed and imparted. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for covering us with the robe of Jesus Christ's righteousness, that, you, that his righteousness is account on our account. And Father, we pray that you may now from inside work your righteousness in us so that we may become more like you, that you may write your laws and your decrees on our heart so that our obedience will be a result of our justification. Help us not to mix fruit and the root. And help us, Father, to wear this breast of righteousness every day because this is the only way we can survive in this spiritual battle. Bless each one of us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.